namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa the dhamma is not meant to be just something that we do when we're sitting on the cushion when we're meditating it's um, kind of an artificial exercise we do to really focus on our mind states but uh, that should be um, their whole life should be our practice everything we do should be incorporated in into the into the Dhamma should be inspired by the Dhamma and we can apply the principles of Dhamma to all our activities no matter what kind of a, a task you're undertaking whether you're uh, bookkeeping or cooking or building or housekeeping or gardening uh, writing you know whatever you're doing you know it should be uh, done in the spirit of Dhamma and then not only will you be developing along the path but whatever you do will be done well that should be your goal at all times to do everything uh, as as good as possible nothing in samsara is ever perfect but it's something we should strive for perfection some useful ways we can apply this I, I always remember uh, two uh, teachings from two of my primary teachers uh, Kema Ananda had a, a, one of his sayings was when you're doing anything you're making something um, if you want to make it beautiful which you should always strive to, to make everything beautiful he said that the beauty is the result of love plus attention to detail. So you have to uh, have a feeling of, of love for what you're doing, that you, uh, you know, cherish your, your, your task, your, your project. And that kind of emotional state is necessary, but it's not sufficient. By itself it's not good enough you also have to have attention to detail you know the, the small details you, know, you drive the nail in straight you know you you um, you know uh, chop the vegetables neatly you know everything you everything you uh, every task you undertake is composed of a multitude of small actions and the result will be cumulative uh, total of all these small actions you know and each little action is itself is a um, uh, a place to apply dhamma to apply to apply mindfulness to uh, strive for perfection the other saying uh, comes from uh, Ajahn Pasano and it's one that has come to be very useful for me personally when to apply at different times and different situations. It's very simple. If you can't get out of it, get into it. If you can't get out of it, get into it. There's In, in uh, any life, you're going to have numerous times when there's something you have to do you, that you really don't want to do, but you've got to do it. So the best way to approach that <clears throat> is not with a mindful of resistance and resentment and disgruntlement, but to really try and get into it, try and find that enthusiasm that you would apply to something you that you naturally like. You just try and you know absorb yourself into the task and and um, get right into it.
One of the teachings of the Buddha that's useful in all situations are the four idipada. That idipada means the uh, the roads to power or the roads to success. And it applies to meditation, but it also applies to mundane tasks of any kind. Whatever you're doing, you should be uh, grounded in the four idipada. And these are chan uh, citta, chanda, virya, vimaksa. Uh, citta is the mind, it's the conscious mind. And in this context, what it means is that your mind is occupied with the task. Your mind is not wandering. You're not doing something else mentally. You're, you're to focused on what you're doing. You make that the object of your attention. You fill your attention. So this is an aspect of, of mindfulness. It's like uh, uh, applying sati or uh, recollectiveness, remembering to be present. And uh, chanda is the is enthusiasm. Um, having a, a mind that is uh, engaged enthusiastically in the task at hand. This recalls also that saying, if you can't get out of it, get into it. You try and find that um, uh, that energy of... Um, uh, desiring results. You know, Chanda, we some, the second noble truth is that uh, suffering is caused by tanha, which is translated by desire. But chanda is also translated by desire. And chanda is not always a negative. It depends on the object. If you have chanda for unwholesome objects, then it's unwholesome. If you have chanda for wholesome objects, it's good. So one of the requirements for making progress is Dhamma Chanda, which is you know, desire for the Dhamma, desire for liberation. And when you're doing any mundane task, you should have a Chanda. You should have this kind of enthusiastic engagement with the task. Wiriya is energy, which means you uh, have to put effort in you have to uh, make the effort to, you know, to carry through the task. Often, uh, it seems that the the hardest moment is the the first moment, you know, to get the energy to get started, and then it once you're doing something, it kind of you can. Uh, find you know you find an, an ongoing stream of energy so you have to overcome any kind of slothfulness and resistance and you know just do it developing energy can be a uh, uh, a self, uh, you know, a positive feedback kind of thing. Once you, you, you get energy by putting out energy, you become a more energetic, uh, you become more energetic by making the effort. And the last one is uh, Vimanksa, which is investigation. And uh, I think a useful way of understanding that is to call it intelligent curiosity. That means whatever you're you're doing, whether it's meditation or some uh, uh, task uh, in in the in the material world, you don't carry it out robotically or mindlessly, but you learn as you go. You constantly pay attention to the results, and you keep it. In, 
um, refining your technique. You you see how how does that work? Okay, and you know you take an interest in understanding the details of what you're doing. This is the uh, this is different than the way um, some people approach a task or meditation actually some people approach meditation this way is to like kind of follow a, a, sch a schematic and a set number of steps and you do this then you do that that may be a way to begin something <laughs> brand new but as you develop you need to learn by doing you keep refining your technique by observing the results. You know? Take the example of um, of uh, cooking. You know, if you just mechanically following the instructions in a cookbook, you might make an acceptable meal, and that may be the best way to approach a new dish you've never done before. But then, to be to be a really good cook and to really learn that you you need to experiment and try you know try your own uh, variations and judge by the results. So, Chitta Chanda Weary Vimangsa, these are the four Idipadas. And uh, they, they, they're things to be uh, born in mind at all times. You know? Another uh, teaching of the Buddha that deals with uh, daily life, in fact, it's you know, probably the most important sutta in this regard, is the Sugala, Sugala Wada Sutta which um, is a discourse the Buddha spoke to a layman uh, expounding on the proper way to for him to live his life. And the idea that comes across in this sutta is that any individual, any person, is involved in a complex matrix or web of interrelationships with other persons. Well, this is an aspect of not-self. Nothing exists from its own side. There is no independent entity. And this applies to human beings in society. So any given human being might be uh, a mother, a daughter, a worker, a manager, a teacher, a student, a friend, a neighbor, and any combination of all these things. There's multiple relationships any individual has reaching out to other human beings. And we're all we're all interrelated, you know, in this network. And it's really like the whole, if you extend it, uh, extend all the, the interrelationships, it really is uh, the whole of humanity. There's this um, idea that was popular a few years ago, and you hear variations of it, that five degrees of connection, that uh, it's the idea that any two human beings, even on remote continents, only have at most five people in between them. Like you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. So, so we're all interrelated. And if you take any one person, they have all these different points of contact with other human beings and in each relationship that you have 
uh, you have duties. This is atta in Pali, and in uh, Sanskrit is arta. And arta is an, uh, uh, is something um, that's a major theme in a lot of the Hindu teachings. It comes up in, in Buddhism as to a minor degree. It, does, it is mentioned, but the idea of uh, your your duty your is your your role in society your duties are defined by your position you know and it varies between the same person might be you know a, uh, a father and a son uh, a brother a neighbor right and in each case there'll be a you'll have different duties and living According to Dhamma, living properly is to fulfill these duties. To fulfill each relationship in a dutiful way. Regard that as, you know, this is, this, these are my duties. And the, um, the interesting detail of the sutta, if you get into the, the language in the Pali, is that each, each person will, going outwards to the other person, will should be motivated by this sense of duty, but they're not to expect and this, and, and that other person has reciprocal duties, but you're not to expect to receive them. You should only hope that out of compassion they will fulfill their duties. So you do your duties regardless, right? And if everybody in society is doing their proper duties, the whole of society will be harmonious and everything will work and everything will be, everyone will be happy and fulfilled. But from your position, your responsibility is not to moan and complain because other people aren't fulfilling their duties, but just do your own duties as to, your, to the best of your ability in all directions in each of your relationships. So the whole of life then is really a practice of Dhamma and living, living skillfully. And it's, this is a way to develop personally, but also to, uh, to live happily and live at peace and to to have a, a sense of fulfillment in your life in some spiritual traditions they make a a lot more emphasis on uh, practical skillfulness the the um sufis uh, some uh, traditional forms of sufism if you go to a sufi teacher every sufi master will be a also a, a master of some skill like carpentry or a, a, a metal work or, or some, some particular skill. And if you go to a Sufi master, he'll first teach you that skill and he won't give you any spiritual teachings until you mastered that skill. That comes first. And then he say, okay, now you're ready. Zen tradition, they have uh, some um, some emphasis on particular things like um, certain manual skills, like uh, uh, the two that they particularly, I've, I've heard of them doing is archery and uh, calligraphy. And there's a very interesting case on, on calligraphy. There was a, there's a book of, on Zen teachings that has a, um, uh, section on uh, calligraphy as a um, as a practice, and it has a photograph of side by side of the same character, Japanese character, done by a master and by um, an intermediate student. And at first glance, uh, you you can sense somehow the master's character is superior it's better but you, it's really hard to put your finger on why but then in the, there's a second set of photographs where they've uh, magnified the image so you can see the end of one of the brush strokes 
and one of the brush strokes, the one by the master, is absolutely crisp. It just ends in a very crisp line. And the one by the student is kind of raggedy at the end, kind of trails off. And the, the write-up explained that the master knows either to be making the stroke or not. There's no moment of hesitation when you're sort of making the stroke and, you know, maybe it's long enough, I don't know. <laughs> he's doing it, then he's not doing it. And it's an absolute distinction. I think that applies to a, to a lot of tasks. You know, the learning to not do it is almost as important as, as doing it. You can certainly apply all of these principles to practice of meditation. That should not be a, a, a rope mechanical exercise. You should have the four idipadas engaged. Your mind should be occupied with the object of meditation. That's almost the definition of meditation. And uh, you should be enthusiastic about it. It's not just a you know, a dull task you have to do. It's like, oh, wait, what? I'm kind of excited. What's going to, what am I going to accomplish? And you put energy into it. You put effort. Rouse yourself to wakefulness. I think it's a good, uh, a good uh, test of your, your wakefulness in meditation is really the immediate aftermath. When you finish the, the, uh, the sit, do you feel groggy and sleepy or do you feel more energized and awake and alert, ready for the day? And the, um, the final one with monks says also very important that you keep refining your technique. Uh, you can learn techniques of meditation from teachers and from books, listening to Dhamma talks, all those things are useful, but it's really only to get you started. It's like the recipes in a cookbook. And then you have to find your own way in the end uh, by observation of the, the effort and the technique and the result. And you take that same attitude into every task you undertake in life, then they, any task can become a meditation. It can become an, an exercise for developing mindfulness. Now, whether it's a task you naturally relish and enjoy, then it's all the better. You know, it's good if you enjoy what you're doing. But if it's something you have to do, you don't naturally enjoy it, then try to remember, if you can't get out of it, get into it. And throw yourself into the into it and try and do it the best you possibly can. Okay, so I'll I'll stop there. Sadhu, 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 sadhu.